Who is the most underrated actor of all time? It's Dolph Lundgren. Correct. Why? Well, because of his uh, spiky hair and yep. his ice cold demeanor and his big muscles. Absolutely. I must break you. My name is Sergeant Andrew Scott. Come on, guys, don't do this. If I don't get breakfast, I get real grumpy. I don't think you like me grumpy. And you go in pieces, asshole. Let's kick some ass. Hello, and welcome back to I Must Break, this podcast. The fan podcast looking at the cinematic career of action legend Dolph Lundgren. Today, we're going back four years and looking at the 2018 action thriller Blackwater. In this one, Dolph reteams with fellow action star Jean Claude Van Damme. Only this time, instead of being adversaries, they're now actually on the same side. Jean Claude Van Damme stars as Scott Wheeler, a deep cover CIA operative who finds himself locked aboard a CIA black site submarine. Dolph stars as Marco, a fellow operative also imprisoned, who helps Wheeler escape their underwater prison. You know how this works, so I'll keep it simple. You're an enemy combatant and will not be granted any rights. This won't go anywhere. Welcome to hell. Lock down this boat right away. The man's a highly decorated officer and a trained killer. He's been taught to adapt, improvise. Just find him. I need you to tell me what is going on right now. Someone is setting me up. It's time to level the playing field. I believe we should get you one of these. I knew I liked you. Let's do this. In the old days, It was just red wire, blue wire. I'm your host, Sean, and returning to the show to help me chat this one, it's been a while, uh, is David Ullman, host of the podcast Long Walk for a Short Drink. David, thank you so much for coming back on, man. Thanks for having me. Hey, Sean. So, I mean, it's been, shoot, has it been what? two years since the last time we chatted i want to say or it's it's just shy of that right yeah i I was trying to i was thinking about it myself and i'm not super sure but it does it both feels like forever ago and yesterday one of those things yeah yeah well i mean and we should probably let the listeners know um the last time i had you on was uh for the last uh jean-claude van damme and dolph pairing which was universal soldier regeneration um I, I i extended the invite for this one for you because i know that i mean look i'm i'm a huge fan of both these guys but i know that you adore mr jcvd and so i kind of had it in my mind i was like look I really want David back. I think this would be the perfect pairing for uh, for us to come on. I, I feel kind of bad, though. Um, I, I feel like we missed out on an opportunity. What we really should have done is you should have found some kind of drink that was Belgian. I should have found a drink that was Swedish to really, really align and make this a uh, a, a real Clash of the Titans, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I'll have to pretend. So, well, again, thank you very, very much for coming back. Um, I, I guess before we di- dip into this film, I'm just curious, what, uh, what's new with you? I know um, we mentioned, we talked about it on the last podcast, but uh, on the last episode, um, but uh, Long Walk for a Short Drink, that particular uh, series is still running, right? We, we actually stopped doing it at the end of last year uh, at our episode 100. We just decided that uh, we were going to, 
I don't know, pause it indefinitely. <laughs> and uh, and so my friend Palmer, with whom I co- co-hosted that show, and and some of the guys that would come on regularly, we still uh, we still gather on a video call just in the same way. We just don't record it, and it's not quite as uh, organized. But uh, yeah, so the the podcast is happening offline, I suppose. <laughs> Okay. Okay. Have you considered starting anything new? I mean, I mean, look, I'll just throw it out there. I think, uh, I think a Jean-Claude Van Damme retrospective filmography analysis would be right up your alley. Have you considered going that route? Um, I might, except for there, there were two, um, similar type shows. Both had pod worked into the, his name, (laughs) the, the, but the Jean, John Pod Van Dam cast uh, that was uh, on the Pod Bros Network for for quite a few years. I have been a guest on that show from time to time, and now they're at a place where I help them archive their their run on YouTube, so folks can listen to the to that run of that goes through his films chronologically, and uh, on the Pod Bros uh, YouTube channel. And then each time he's on in a new movie, which has only happened twice in the last. Uh, couple of years since they had finished their run the the uh, john and jeff invite me on and and we kind of keep that going right on right on well that's an excellent segue there because again and i don't i don't want to sleep on this um but i know that uh yeah you were a huge fan of uh of mr van dam growing up as were so many i mean as was i i mean i in fact i distinctly remember seeing films like street fighter and uh, uh the quest you know, in theaters, you know, their opening weekend. So, I mean, I'm right there with you, but I wanted to get your take real quick before we dive into this film. I wanted to get your take on the current state of where Mr. JCVD is at career wise. I have a few theories myself, but I, of course, I wanted to get your opinion and your take, but um, his career is uh, pretty much, I don't know how you want to refer to it. I, I, I think it's, he's kind of stepped into a bit of a semi-retirement. I guess we could say he's uh, he seems to have kind of put a lot of things on pause. And and like I said, I have some theories about this on, on why this could be happening. But I wanted to get your take on what has been going on with uh, Mr. JCVD. And I think that could kind of help explain um, his placement in this film as well. Yeah, I well, um, I haven't followed his career as closely the last so many years as i used to i mean um i have a a a two and a half inch three ring binder with like you know uh plastic sleeves that i that i kept as a as a kid in the uh, late 80s early 90s where i put all this like inside karate clippings and stuff and uh that was the heyday of my fandom and I, i kept up throughout you know the the following decades and stuff but less closely to the point where there's a few I haven't seen in the like m- mid two thousands or so, but it's funny because where the, this year, 2018, that Blackwater came out, um, which incidentally I didn't, I missed until, until watching it for the, the podcast here. But uh, JC, as I call him, <laughs> that's right. That's right. So yeah. Well, the friend with the, friend with the binder, I think, I think you're more <laughs> yeah. than uh, allowed to, give him a nickname considering you have a binder that's right i'm not allowed to come with it so many feet though so th- there's that yeah but um <laughs> so but 2018 he within a 14 month period he had four films come out and uh this being the 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 first of them so and, and most of them were like more prominent starring roles than had started to be the case and so um, well, I think I, I, I sense, or I agree a little bit with the, what you were saying about a kind of semi retirement, cause he'll show up in movies and it's not for very long or he'll do these like, mm-hmm. you know, voice cameos and he's made really good use. I think of like kind of poking fun at himself, uh, really, you know, brilliantly in the JCVD movie that came out in 2008, but then again with Zhang Claude Van Johnson that was the series on Amazon and I think 2017 and actually just recently I think it was last year the last mercenary on Netflix was a really fun kind of uh, like it's literally almost like a French farce <laughs> I, I actually literally almost it was a French farce of sorts but Van Damme played I think he played this like 
CIA type agent and he was always in disguise, but it was very often played for comedy and it had a lot of fun about it. And I think if I had one critique of his later career is that it was all, all very dour and he's, his lids are like half closed half the time and he's just kind of laconic and I don't know. It didn't have the energy and charm that he did when he was younger. And I'm really happy to see that there is a little bit of that, at least here in Blackwater. But yeah, that's kind of what I've observed the last few years. Yeah. Well, and, you know, p- point of contrition here, I'll just admit it right now. Um, I actually didn't finish the last mercenary. I, I started it and I wanted to finish it. I wanted to like it, but I, for the life of me, I just could not, I couldn't do it. And I, I think oh, a lot of it is because, is be, yeah, I, I know, and I'm sorry. I'm glad to hear that you enjoyed it. I just did not find, and I think what a lot of it is, to be perfectly honest, I'll, I'll just admit it. I think what a lot of it is, is the fact that um, this was a French film that, you know, was, <laughs> was made for French audiences. And I think French humor does not translate um, always 100% well with, uh, with American audiences. So I think maybe that was, Part of the reason I, it's one that I, I realize I need to go back and I need to check out because like you said, if you look at his career and the films that he had done, I mean, yeah, he was, I, I, I mean, I, I've been saying this for the past couple of years. I think that uh, Jean-Claude is essentially kind of in a, a semi-retirement. You know what I mean? He's just, I don't think his, uh, his drive is there as much as it used to be. And like I said, I have a few theories for this. And so, yeah, around 20 from about, 2014 to 2018 or so. Yeah. Like you said, he was taking on small bit roles that were essentially really just playing off his image, I guess we can Mm -hmm. say, but with the last mercenary, yeah, he seemed a little bit more alive once again, but there were still so many scenes where it was like, that's not Jean-Claude. Like I can tell that's a stunt double there. You know what I mean? Oh yeah. Yes, of course. Yeah. (laughs) That one is a, I mean, it is a very particular tone. I I will totally concede that point. And I just, if you couldn't get into it, I don't know that you need to force yourself back in (laughs) to finish it. (laughs) Well, I mean, and I I've kind of said this on, on previous episodes, but I just want to re reiterate it or echo it again. I think one of the big reasons for Mr. Jean-Claude's retirement is the, the market and the, the 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 shift i guess we can say that the the action market has been going into okay when when jean-claude first started doing direct to video movies okay the dvd market was was still pretty big and was still pretty booming with the dvd market shrinking and largely kind of disappearing and everything going to streaming suddenly the budgets for these films are shrinking way 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 down and so i think for a guy like jean claude who went from at one time starring in films that were being made for between 30 to you know 50 million suddenly starring in a film that is being made for barely 2 million if that even of course he's not going to be on set for more than a few days and of course when he's there like you said, I love what you said as you said it on the last episode, his, his lids barely look half open and yeah, he's playing, uh, he's playing tired in a lot of these films. He's playing yeah. very, very dour and it's, it seems like he's almost kind of sleepwalking in a lot of these roles. And I think a lot of that is because, I mean, when he did the film in hell, that was him playing dour and we had never seen that really before from him. So there was at that time, it was a bit of a revelation, but who would have thought that 10, 15 years later, he would still be playing these just quiet, stone-faced badasses who barely even blink? And if you look at Jean-Claude from like the double impact era where he's just so goofy and charismatic and smiling to what we have, you know, within the past 10 years, it's like, man, that's, that's a bit of a shift there. Yeah, I, I think from what I could tell... It seems like he tries to step out of that. Like even in 2013, I think it was that year, he did a movie called Welcome to the Jungle, where he's like mm-hmm. front and center on the poster and he, he plays a comedic character. And I, th- I think a lot of the stuff he, he's come to do with it, making fun of his own image is, is attempts to try new things. But I think ultimately it's like, I, oh, I did hear him talk about this somewhere where he's like, he's like, there's so many pictures of me with the same, he didn't say stupid face, but he said something like that. Same like blank expression on a poster. And I think he said something to the effect of just like, that's all that 
that's what would get movies made. So it wasn't necessarily mm-hmm. like what he wanted to do, but it was all people would kind of let him do. And I think even this movie is, uh, I, I was surprised to see because without getting into it too much, I, I liked it more than I thought I would. And I really feared that it would be something along the lines of his, like, uh, what's this 2001 or two movie derailed <laughs> where it was on like oh, on yeah. the train. And I think some folks dislike that movie even more than that. Oh. I, I do. I, I just saw it the once. I mean, I, of course I own it, but <laughs> I don't think I pulled it out again, but I, 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 I worried it was going to be this kind of like ultra low budget and hands off. I thought he would just be in it. I kind of thought he would be in it as about as much as Dolph turned out to be. <laughs> so I was pleased to see him engage that much, but it was his company, Rodan Entertainment, that like div- is one of the producers and developed it. So he seemed to have some investment in at least bringing this to the screen, though I did hear your interviews with both Patrick Patrick Kilpatrick and uh, Chad Law, the 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 villain and um, writer, respectively, of this film. And so I have those stories kind of in the back of my head as well for what whatever happened once once cameras started to roll. <laughs> so I don't know. Well, well, thank first of all, thank you so much for listening to those. And yeah, Patrick Kilpatrick, man. That dude, um, I, I was a little scared and a little intimidated talking oh, to him. Oh man, yeah. I mean, oh, I you was know, scared for you. But um, boy, that guy, he does not mince words one bit. He he says what's on his mind, and uh, yeah, he's he's gone into in later interviews where he speaks about working with Jean Claude, where he kind of alludes to there being some brain damage or whatever. And I, of course, oh. don't want to. I don't want to speak on that. I don't want to speculate on that or anything. Cause that's not my place, but yeah, he's, he's kind of alluded to that. That might be kind of what's going on with Mr. Uh, with, with Mr. Jean-Claude. And I remember he, he said something else in the interview that was interesting is that um, sorry about my dog upstairs, uh, but he, uh, he, he made two comments. Of them here. There you go. It, but he made comments where he basically said that uh, Jean-Claude had trouble remembering his lines and it was difficult for him to even get out of his trailer. And so as a result, they're, they're shooting his scenes separately. And so Patrick Kilpatrick is essentially having to talk to like a, uh, uh, a tennis ball on a stick. You know what I mean? Yes. And, and, yeah. and so you hear that and it's kind of like, I don't know. It's, it's a bit of a, uh, it's a bit of a gut punch. You know what I mean? To your heart, I guess. <laughs> Yeah, and I the uh, the thing that stuck out to me that he said um, that Patrick Kilpatrick said on on the podcast was when he he said he saw Jean Claude as a tragic figure ravaged by his excesses. That wording like really like stuck out at me, and uh, I that bummed me out because I sort of as someone who's followed his career, like I remember you know as a kid. Um, you know, reading his interviews and stuff, it was all about, you know, health and exercise and all this. So as he rose to the top of sort of the Hollywood, well, not quite to the top, but, you know, upper echelons of the Hollywood um, food chain, he got rather wrapped up in a lot of the trappings of that lifestyle. And as that would come out in like the the press, it was a little... um. I don't know, a little disillusioning, I guess, for, you know, to be his fan. But then it seemed like he would he would kind of come out of it and like be, you know, back to his old self again. And I think he's probably ridden that roller coaster ever since is this the sense I, I get. And the other thing that I I obviously I am not a doctor and I don't know him personally. I'm not allowed to come within so many feet of him, but (laughs) I do know he's got, he suffers from bipolar depression that was, I think undiagnosed for a long time. And so so, part of me wonders, you know, that I don't know what the medications are like for that exactly, but I I have to imagine that it, it levels or balances things out. So the highs aren't so high and the lows maybe aren't so low. And so I don't know if, you know like does he then go off those meds when he's trying to act uh and if so is that the kind of thing that's keeping him in his trailer and forcing you know the sandman to act act against the sea stand with a tennis ball on it i Mm -hmm. i don't know it's just a lot of conjecture and i guess i just was disappointed because from the outer 
sort of projection of what he's done through social media that his mom runs his social media. <laughs> uh, perhaps that has something to do with the, uh, the clean image, but it seemed like he had his act together a bit better in recent years. But then like I'd hear little things that would make me wonder otherwise. And of course the, I, th- I think Patrick Kilpatrick was doing his best to be diplomatic and, and, uh-huh. and generous and kind, but he was also trying not to because <laughs> i did notice in the scene that they shared in that room the interrogation room the only time that when there was a third actor present there was a couple wide shots but otherwise i i noticed that they were never in the same like profile or master shot together there was like one reflection shot where they were both in it but you can kind of fake that and so ugh, it's uh, the whole tragic figure ravaged by his excesses is uh really just kind of caught in my craw. <laughs> well, and yeah, I mean, and what's interesting, I don't know if you picked up on this, this is going to be one of my, uh, one of my points in my notes, but yeah, um, it's really interesting how, if you notice, especially in the films of the past 10 years, Jean-Claude's son, Christopher Van, is, is it Van, yeah. has he taken on the name Van Dam or is he still Van Varenberg? I can't oh, remember. That's a good question. I, his, I've, he, maybe both at times. I don't yeah. Know. <laughs> but what's interesting is his son always pops up. In yes. in yeah. bit roles, usually so a lot of times as a bad guy or as a henchman that Van Dam has to fight, and so you know on one hand it's it's great, it's like hey he's he's getting a role for a son, all right, that's cool. But then on the other hand, you almost kind of wonder, and again I'm purely speculating, I don't know, but I almost kind of wonder if maybe that's written into Jean Claude's contract, and that if you hire Jean Claude, you're going to find a role for his son, and I wonder if. I mean, just go with me on this one, but I wonder if his son is there to kind of help to kind of work as a, uh, uh, as a buffer, if you will, or a middleman, if you will, between Jean-Claude and the production crew. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah, I don't yeah. know. I mean, it makes a little sense. I mean, I hate to, to yeah. keep, um, t- you know, talking about him in this way of conjecture, but I don't get the chance to very often. It's unfortunate that this will be heard publicly. So I'll try to temper it, <laughs> temper it. but I, I I love like special edition Blu-rays, all the kind of like firsthand behind the scenes information about movies I can get. I'm all excited about. And so a couple years ago, there was a double impact deluxe Blu-ray uh, edition that came out with a bunch of behind the scenes stuff. And um, Sh- uh, Sheldon Ledich, the director of that movie and the writer of Bloodsport and someone who worked with John Claude a lot at uh, in the early part of his career He didn't use the word bipolar, but he talked about Jean-Claude as being this guy who you didn't know who you were going to get, like which Van Damme you were going to get day to day. And that that's where that two characters of Alex and um, Chad came from, you know, as they were developing that story. And I I think I think that's kind of interesting. And and yeah, there's a lot of people in his early movies that show up, uh, you know, that seem to be kind of family friends, like the Michel Kisi, the play Tom Poe and his brother. And, uh, I think, yeah, I think he's a loyal guy, but your, your theory about the, uh, the son kind of offering some, I don't know, maybe support to his dad. I know he travels with his little dog as well. Yeah. <laughs> maybe <laughs> something like that. But I was happy to see Chris in this. Um, it looks like he is going by Van Damme. Uh, in the credits of this one. And I thought he looked badass with that beard and, and bald head. Oh, he has, he's taken after his dad in terms of uh, martial arts prowess and abilities. I mean, he, when he, when he throws down in those scenes, I don't know if you saw kill them all or not. Um, that was another oh, small little yet. film that's yeah. That so the one um, that, that you, you talked about really liking, is it six bullets? I think that's from maybe from the same writer. Is it something like that? It was another I'd missed. Um, Yeah, Six Bullets, actually, and that one's actually streaming on Netflix now, FYI. Um, uh, But yeah, um, (laughs) they they pair the two together. Only in Six Bullets was interesting is Chris is not... um, He's not an adversary or a henchman. He's uh, uh, he's Jean-Claude. Actually, in that one, now that I think about it, he plays Jean-Claude's son, actually, who partners with him on various missions. But um, but yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, you already said it, so I just want to echo it again. What what I will say about this film that was was kind of nice to see is considering the, yeah, Jean-Claude had been taking nothing but uh, these bit supporting roles in various films. It was really, really cool in 2018 
to see JC, as you call him. Um, you can call him that too. <laughs> okay, thanks, man. Um, him, him taking on a lead role again. You know what I mean? Him taking yeah. on a lead role where he is front and center. And the other thing that I will say, and th- this is, I mean, c- kind of, this is the fanboy in me, I guess we can say, but the idea of reteaming Jean Claude with Dolph Lundgren, this is an idea that I think fans of the genre have been wanting ever since they first squared off together in uh, 1992 in Universal Soldier. Okay. And I remember, it's funny, but I remember around 99, 2000 or so, it was around that time when Jean Claude was starting to kind of hit the direct to video market. I remember at the time thinking, you know, now is the time that would be wonderful for the two of them to do another movie together. But yeah, where they're not adversaries, but where they're um, joining forces, working on the same side. I thought that was really intriguing. And at the time, I always kind of liked the idea of them teaming up in like a buddy cop type movie. You know what I mean? Oh, like yeah. Like, type movie. Yeah, like Showdown in Little Tokyo, but with Van mm-hmm. I always thought that would have been really kind of cool. Um, what's I guess kind of unfortunate about this one is I mean, there were there were a few red flags about this one right out of the gate that I will just say. But when I heard that uh, they were going to be teaming up once again for a project, I was like, yes, that sounds like a great idea. I'm looking forward to it. Maybe perhaps it's a little late in their careers, but um, that's fine. I will take it. The problem with me was that um, it, it, it's set on a submarine. And at mm-hmm. the time, I remember thinking like, Okay, in in the late '90s, early 2000s, when the direct to video market was was, or excuse me, the the DVD market was really really big. I mean, shoot, we saw tons of these low budget movies set on submarines, and so for them to be relying on that again in 2018, for me, that did not do much for my excitement at all. And sadly, I think a lot of those fears kind of um, came to fruition uh, when when I watched the film. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I was a little worried too. I think that idea of it just being, you know, underwater in this contained thing that, and I guess the little press type pictures I'd seen did have me fearing that it was going to be this kind of really just dark and depressing. And it's a little long for this kind of movie, at least like on paper. And was, it does. Oh boy, so this should be, so you're right. This should be a 90 exactly minute movie. That. Yeah, this yeah, should be a 90-minute movie, and it, it goes on at least 15 more minutes than it really needs to. And it would have been nice to get him and Dolph working together sooner, because that was a real... Like, when that happened, I was like, oh. Because I actually... I, wa- I, I watched up until a certain point, maybe like 45 minutes or close to an hour in, and then I was getting really tired, and I tried to go to bed, but then some people in my neighborhood were... I don't know what was going on. They were having the largest party of the year. And so I literally couldn't sleep. So I was like, all right, I'll come out and get this going again. And then it like, I'll finish this damn movie for Sean's podcast. Yeah. Well, but right? then I got, <laughs> but then it got like kind of more interesting. And I was, he was like winking at Dolph. I was like, okay, I'm on board for this. Like put this like earlier and cut off 15 minutes of, I don't know what, but it, yeah, it was uh, it was weird. It wasn't like two different movies exactly, but it didn't all quite congeal, you know, as tightly as I think would have been nice. But um, yeah, I, do you want to kind of go through the the plot or or t- just talk about it in general? Well, I, I yeah, actually, and before we uh, before we go down either of those avenues, the one thing that I want to say about this real quick, I don't know if you picked up on this or not either, um, but did you see Escape Plan from 2013 with uh, Schwarzenegger and Stallone? No, I, I'm not even sure I've heard of that, but I, I'm suddenly interested. Oh, my goodness. Okay. All right. So what's interesting is, okay, in 2013, a film came out called Escape Plan which put Sylvester Stallone and uh, and Arnold Schwarzenegger together in a film. And so I'm, I'm surprised you haven't heard of it. You, I think it's worth checking out. It's uh, it, it has a few problems with it, but um, I think Schwarzenegger is a lot of fun in it. Stallone is really cool. I mean, and there's just a certain kind of novelty that, uh, you know, in seeing Stallone and Schwarzenegger occupying the same space on screen that is just wonderful to see. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, um, so I would recommend, uh, you check that out, but here's what's interesting about it. Okay. This film parallels escape plan almost identically to the T. Okay. Oh. Only 
what's what's interesting is, and my buddy Chris kind of coined this term, so I don't want to uh, take credit for it, but um, this film is pretty much the the junior varsity version of Escape Plan. Okay, so if you watch Escape Plan, I mean, the parallels between the two are so identical. You almost kind of wonder if if Chad Law saw Escape Plan and you know was just kind of I don't know, but. Um, Stallone's character in Escape Plan is put into a black site high tech prison where he <laughs> teams up with a fellow prisoner who's already there, who is Arnold Schwarzenegger, and the two of them team up and hatch a plan to get out of uh, to get out of this high tech prison. It's the most advanced prison ever built. Its location is top secret. And when they erase your identity, you cease to exist. Who were you before you came in here? I break out of prisons for a living. The people who paid for you to be here want you here forever. The only way to stay alive is to break out. I'm gonna burn this place to the ground. Let's do it. Which, just by me telling you that premise, that is the exact same thing we have going on here in this one. Only <laughs> Stallone is the Jean-Claude character. Dolph Lundgren is the Arnold Schwarzenegger character. Both, uh, both these stories obviously take place on these black site prison, uh, prisons that are kind of under the radar. You have Schwartz in escape plan. You have Schwarzenegger. He's the resident prisoner showing Sly around who's new to the prison. This film is basically following those exact beats. But you know what? Here's the problem with, here's the big problem in my opinion with both of these stories is that they came way too late. Okay. I mean, I think if you're going to put, you know, these two icons together in a film, pull a universal soldier and do it when the, when the, the two guys are in their prime, you know what I mean? Yeah. yeah and it reminds me, I, cause I was, uh, what did I listen to? Oh, your expendables two episode was so much fun okay. for me because I was not expecting the you and your guest to be so pro Van Damme in that movie. I don't know. I thought it'd just be a bit oh, more he's balanced. wonderful. Your, in it. Yeah. your excitement, your respective excitement with you both kind of come off the bat of like, I just got to say like, he was great in this. And so I was just so delighted by that. And then I think you guys talk some about universal soldier being this sort of first team up, uh, you know, at least an early one of these kind of action stars that would grow into this sort of, free for all that that Stallone cultivated with the the Expendables films. But yeah, I, I it would have been nice to see more of that. I I uh, I like the podcast um how did this get made and there's a lot of Van Damme and Stallone movies <laughs> that are featured on that and a lot of good-natured ribbing and sometimes then some backstory and I learned from that podcast that Demolition Man that ultimately was uh Stallone and Wesley Snipes was developed for Van Damme and Seagal. And yep. somehow or other, that didn't quite happen. And so it's like, it's so, man, these things that, so I wonder how much like, you know, people try to get going and then just doesn't pan out for one reason or other. And so much changes. And it was very interesting here in Chad Law talk about, you know, the, this movie and even how he got into writing to begin with. But if I'm, I'm remembering correctly, didn't he sort of, wasn't he given like the assignment to write a movie that took place on a submarine? Something like exactly. That. Yeah, yeah. Well, that that's an awesome segue there. Um, because yeah, I suspect I have a sneaking suspicion about this, but I suspect that this was a script that Jean Claude and Dolph were more or less pigeonholed into. Mm-hmm. Because I, 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 I mean, you would think, okay, if you're getting if you're putting together a film where you're putting these two, I'm going to use a term that you said when we discussed uh, regeneration, but rarefied beings. Okay, <laughs> I remember you said that. But yeah, I mean, if you're gonna if you're gonna take a uh, 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 an idea, put together a movie with these two rarefied beings together, then I would think put something together that is tailor made and is written for each of these actors' strengths. I will say though, and this is just my opinion, I don't know if you felt this or not, but I feel like because the location is so confined, I mean, it takes place on a submarine. You know what I mean? There's not much you can really do with a submarine. I think that uh, Jean Claude and Dolph are merely just kind of going through the motions. And if this was written at the uh, at the forefront, and this is no discredit to Mr. Chad Law by any means, but I think if I, I would like to think that if he had known from the uh, from the offset of hey, we have Dolph for you know seven days, we have Jean Claude for fifteen days, I would like to think that he would have said, well, you know what, I'm going to create 
I'm going to create characters that's going to play to their strengths. But unfortunately, I mean, we don't see enough of Dolph. And what we do see of Van Damme, he doesn't really get to do a whole lot of kicking. You know what yeah, I mean? That so, was bumming me out until it finally kicked in, pun always intended, late in the game. But even that, it was not quite the, you know, there's not spin and kicks i don't know i know he's got to try to keep it more grounded these days sometimes literally on the ground but ah come on give, give me a little jean claude give me a little back spin kick yeah yeah well i mean if we if we just go through the uh the plot real quick i mean there, there's not to be honest with this one david there's really not much um that that we can say or that we can add i mean jean claude plays scott wheeler who's this uh he's this deep cover operative a very rote and uh, basic role. It almost feels like something that Steven Seagal would play, you know, just he's a CIA operative, if you will. Um, the film opens with Jean-Claude. He's waking up in a dark room on a submarine. He's imprisoned. It's been deemed a CIA, quote unquote, black site. And his name, his neighbor in the film is uh, is played by Dolph Lundgren. OK, he's playing the character named Marco. Um, Marco has obviously been there considerably longer than uh, than Jean-Claude. And w- what's so cool about about the way Dolph is playing this. And this is one of those things that I wonder if maybe when Dolph came on board, he kind of I, I've heard and I've spoken to various individuals that have kind of alluded to when when Dolph comes on set, he loves to add little nuances to his character. And so with this one, Dolph, his character, Marco, is almost Zen-like. He likes to read literature and he kind of, he kind of makes these uh, personal drawings around his cell that kind of are like his wallpaper, if you will. And I'd like yeah. to think that those little touches were on Dolph's behalf. You got a name? Marco. Okay. Okay, I'm Scott. How can I get out of here? You don't. Well, unless you're a fan of body bags. Oh. So you're about to meet Weddle and Dax. Stand back and turn around. Step back, hands on the wall. I want to speak to someone in charge. Hands on the wall now! It's been a while since I felt a woman's touch. Show me your pecs, baby. (laughs) Yeah, I like to think that too. I mean, he did do a lot with a little with this one. And really, he he was the one with all the the charm, I thought. And it, it, uh, it was a real breath of fresh air every time we did get to see him. Even though it was so often just like in a shot that was obviously done like on a day that the other person wasn't there for a lot of the incel yeah. type stuff. But yeah, I, he was, he was, he was great in this. I, I just, like anyone who's a fan of his, I'm sure it'd be like, just give us more of that and less of whatever this sort of plot that they're trying to wrap it all in. Obviously it's going to start off with, with Jean-Claude in this, uh, in this cell, if you will, it then it takes, it then it goes to a flashback. Okay, scene where we get to see, okay, this is what Wheeler was on. This was his previous assignment that led him to being imprisoned. I have quite a few thoughts on these particular scenes. I wanted to get your take on them, but let's just let's just run through them real quick. Okay. So Wheeler's previous assignment is in Mobile, Alabama. Um, his partner on assignment is also his love interest. Um, this is one of those <laughs> This is one of those aspects that's interesting. The gal playing his uh, 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 his partner in love interest, um, the actress's name is Courtney B. Turk. She is, I mean, let's just say it. She's young enough to be his daughter. And that is it's exactly what I thought. It creeped me and way out. It's so creepy because, I mean, it's really this disturbing trend, I would say, especially within these low-budget action movies, where it seems like the uh, the action stars are getting older and older, but for some reason these producers feel that it's like they're afraid to cast a female over the age of 30. 
And so it's yeah. just really interesting. You mentioned derailed. And the one thing that I remember about derailed that I really, really appreciated about that one was they, they, the, the actress who they cast as Jean-Claude's wife in that one was of age and it worked. Yeah. You know what I mean? I don't know if yeah. you remember that or not. I can't remember her specifically, but I was thinking about that whole age thing and, and I, I, ah, man, I get, uh, these things are probably all like pre-sold in foreign territories and they have to have certain things. And so it's just kind of, it's so unfortunate, but if you, I just, uh, you think about universal soldier, you know, I mean, so Allie Walker is, she's not an unattractive woman by any means, but she's not this sort of cookie cutter, you know, she didn't look like every other indistinguishable actress, you know, of a certain age at that, at 1992, you know, she had a, a distinct, quality about her and unique charm and she was funny and ballsy and it was great and she had the, these the the actresses in this movie like uh i hate to say bad things about it, but you got the, like the megan fox character we'll talk about later and then and then this one who played his love interest and it was just like oh it was rough <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, yeah, no, I mean, it's especially grotesque how the camera in the film feels the need to kind of linger on her as she's changing. Yeah, you know what I mean? And that, it, was, that shot was in the trailer, ultimately. I was just like, what are we doing here? Yeah. It's like 60 years old. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, okay, so Wheeler and Ballard, they're on assignment. They're working deep cover trying to find the mole in their agency. Huge shootout ensues at the mo- at the motel where uh, Wheeler and Ballard were staying. And this team of, we find out that this team of paramilitary assassins are after, wait for it, wait for it, the flash drive. How many times have we seen this in these films where the MacGuffin of the film is a flash drive? Do you think that by 20, I'm just wondering, at, at what point in these films do you think that the flash drive is no longer going to be the sought after instrument that drives the plot. Oh man. I think we're probably looking at another five years at least, but, but this one was fun. Cause at least you had Van Damme with his accent saying maybe my favorite, not my favorite line in the movie. I don't know what that would be, but the one that caught my attention that I had to write it down. I'll just say phonetically when he says, I've got to dungle. <laughs> it's like, that's right. What? I've got, yeah, yeah. The do- I, I had to watch it twice. I'm like, what? Oh, I've got the dongle. Don't make him say that. Come on. <laughs> And, okay, so, I mean, I don't want to get to the big spoiler here yet, but uh, uh, Melissa Ballard is killed, okay? Uh, Wheeler is eventually drugged and imprisoned, okay? When he wakes up, okay, this was a real welcome addition that I really liked. Um, Yeah, we see that uh, Patrick Kilpatrick, the great Patrick Kilpatrick, Sandman from Death Warrant. I mean, come on. This guy's dossier of, of villains that he's played is electric it's just awesome to see him on screen um he turns up as the antagonist once again and i mean man this is i mean this is one dude i mean no matter how old he gets he has that voice about him where he is just so imposing i've always said it before but i always thought what's interesting about death warrant i don't think that uh death warrant is one of van damme's best movies however i will say that uh, uh the sandman patrick kilpatrick is one of Van Damme's best villains. Okay. Yeah. And here, um, his character's name is Patrick Ferris. He's the chief officer of SAD, which is the special activities division. I'll, I'll get your take, but uh, what was your, uh, what, what were your thoughts on seeing uh, uh, Mr. Kilpatrick turn up in this film? I had not seen him in forever. I, there must've been some point, I guess I, did see last man standing back when it came out. But when, when he was kind of going through the, the list of the various movies that he's been in and the various kind of action stars, he's worked opposite. I, I really somehow had missed even things like minority port that, that I would like to, and have meant to see, I haven't yet. So I really know him almost exclusively as the Sandman from wow, 30 years ago. And so just to see him as an older man for the first time, and kind of just the way that he carried himself and the suit and all of that and the more kind of subdued way, not, not subdued, like <laughs> tranquilized, but uh, just a little bit more low key. It, it took some adjusting. Uh, you know, when he says this line that I'm sure we'll talk about, that was, 
I perked up, but it was also it was so just kind of like even keeled. But he is like he's so imposing a presence that I guess he probably doesn't need to, you know, really uh, turn on the energy to 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 intimidate people. It's just kind of inherent in his, you know, being. Well, here's one of the big issues with that, okay? You're going to cast, and I get why they're doing this, okay? They're kind of trying to, I think, employ a little bit of misdirection, if you will. Um, But uh, spoiler here, uh, it turns out that uh, uh, Wheeler, okay, so that's Van Damme's character, Wheeler's superior Rhodes is actually the one who's dirty. He kills all of the CIA interrogators, including Patrick Kilpatrick's character. And so for me... This was, I mean, already going into this, I was kind of like, all right, it takes place on a submarine. How many times have we seen that? Whatever. But then when Kilpatrick shows up, I kind of get perked up a bit. And I'm like, okay, this could be cool. Suddenly, I don't know if you felt this way or not, but once his character is killed, it's almost like the stakes for me completely went out the window. And I started to get bored with it. I mean, and and I think that is a real testament. And I even told that to Kilpatrick. I was like, dude, you left the film way too early to where suddenly I quit caring about <laughs> about what was going on. And I don't know if uh, if you felt that way or not, but he is such a cool, imposing presence. And for him to get killed immediately, it is it is shocking, I'll admit it, but he is such a great villain that the villain who comes in after him doesn't even hold a candle to what Kilpatrick does on screen. Yeah, that was, I mean, I think that's part of the appeal, you know, you get Van Damme and Patrick O'Patrick reunited as like, you know, hero and villain, and then you throw Dolph in, it's like, this should be great, and then (laughs) they kill him off in the first whatever, like 20 minutes, and I get it, the same as you said, it's like for a certain effect, but it, uh, because I was trying to think to myself, like, would I have preferred then he play the guy that was, that turns out to be the real bad guy, and um I guess that would have tipped the, it probably would have ruined the surprise. You know, you'd be like, well, of course, Patrick Kilpatrick's the bad guy, but yeah, I missed him when he was gone for sure. Well, and I'm, I mean, if we go back to the MacGuffin real quick, I mean, I, I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to lay on this either. Okay. But I mean, this the is what the dongle. Yes. Sorry. Sorry. The dongle. <laughs> so I, I just want to, like I said, I don't want to lay on this. Okay. But all right, so we have Wheeler. He's suspected of treason, okay? Um, his superiors think that he has switched sides and he is selling the desired flash drive on the black market. Apparently, it has numerous incriminating files. Of course it does, okay? <laughs> That's with all of these things. So it's interesting, okay? So Melissa Ballard, okay? Um, that was uh, that was uh, 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 Van Damme's partner. Okay, she has the flash drive, but Wheeler has the activation key. The flash drive is worthless without the activation key. Wheeler knows this, so he is hiding the key's whereabouts. And so, what ensues is pretty much a lot of shooting, a lot of running. They're going through the corridors of the submarine. Okay, Van Damme is running. They're trying to shoot him to get the to get the the key to get the flash drive working. We've seen it all before. I don't know if I'd say I've seen it before, if I've seen it done more exciting before, but that's what's going on. Can I ask, I'd like to ask a really possibly dumb question about the shooting of automatic guns or any kind of guns on a submarine. Is everything just (laughs) built out of, because it it took me a while. I'd be embarrassed to say this. It was probably like in the last, you know quarter of the movie where there was a lot of shooting i was like wait a second <laughs> they're on a sub yes yeah what is, aren't you in danger of like puncturing the walls and then if not when that stuff just ricochet everywhere in, in problematic ways so i i, I should I'm, I'm gonna screenshot you my notes but that was my exact issue as well is okay. okay if if you're gonna be set in i mean you would think okay if you're if you're writing a film that's set on a submarine then you know what come up with some other um some other instruments, I guess, that our characters can use. I mean, I don't know. Knives, if you will. Yes, it's like that old line from Enter the Dragon. It's like, why don't somebody take a forty-five and bang, settle it? <laughs> it's because, like, you got to take that out of the equation if you want people to fight hand-to-hand. And you got these two brilliant martial artists in your movie, and you got to, I don't want to ever see Jean-Claude shoot a gun again in my life. I know. So it's just such a... I thought I was miss. I thought I was just like hadn't seen enough of these kind of movies to to know that like oh it's fine you could shoot guns on submarines but now knowing that it's unconscionable 
Well, I, no, exactly. <laughs> it's it seems it seems almost lazy. I mean, you know, I mean, it came out. What's interesting is that actually it came out in the same year. But did you see Hunter Killer with Gerard Butler? No, I, I man, I'm out of the loop. I'm realizing. Okay, I feel like I'm giving you your your next watch list. I appreciate here. that. I, I hope you're writing it down. Yeah. So, um, if you see Hunter Killer, okay, Hunter Killer is not amazing by any means, okay. But what Hunter Killer does right is, okay, there is another film that is set on a submarine. But what's interesting is you're watching it, and it really, as a viewer, takes you into the submarine, and you kind of you believe that it is set on a submarine, okay? Because what you have. You have these tight confines, very, very tight confines. You have these very, very low ceilings in the film. And so it, it looks and feels like a submarine. With this particular film, and I don't know if you felt this way or not, but yeah, thanks to all of the crazy nonsense automatic gunfire that we see, okay, there are so many scenes where I, for, I forgot that they were even on a submarine. Okay, I forgot that yeah. they were even on a submarine. And so what the film does, it's almost kind of like I wonder if in post-production they realized this because what you get every 15 minutes in the film is you get a CGI exterior shot of the sub Ooh, to kind of, to kind of rough <laughs> to kind of to kind of remind you, "Hey, by the way, this this takes place that it's uh that it's on a submarine." But um yeah, I mean that that was the big thing that stuck out to me is okay, in this particular film, you don't really have those low ceilings. You don't really have those tight confines. You have walls that appear to be made of concrete, and this is on a submarine. It's like I'm I'm sorry, but that is something else that's taking me out. Yeah. Oh, uh, I yeah, I agree. I there and and the lighting on this submarine, like I've never <laughs> seen so many multicolored gels. <laughs> Of like you know lighting gels of like orange and green and blue and i think maybe there were some purples and stuff and they are really you know they're making it look like a disco or something you you kind of alluded to it earlier so i just want to talk about it real quick i, I will say and it, maybe i'm a little biased okay considering the nature of the podcast i'll admit that right now but i think dolph's marco character is the best part about this film i don't know if you felt that way or not but you can tell i think for dolph's limited screen time i think he's collectively on screen for maybe 10 minutes, but you can tell he's having fun with what yeah. little they have given him. He totally is. Yeah. When I don't, I don't want us to get too far past that. Did, were you going to mention uh, Patrick Kilpatrick's call back to death warrant in the, in the interrogation scene? Did you catch that line? I'll, I'll let you, I'll let you do it. Uh, this is your moment. I mean, so he's threatening to like stick a needle in Van Damme's eye and, and then Van Damme's, <laughs> so stupid he's just like he's, he's like this going to go nowhere <laughs> like you can't possibly torture any information out of him so patrick kilpatrick just is like all right <laughs> he doesn't say that but he just goes welcome to hell oh and, that's right uh, yes you know, it's just like oh my just lit up but like it was again so subdued like can you imagine if he was just like welcome to hell <laughs> like in death for it <laughs> i know i know it would have been too big but Oh, come on. <laughs> Another missed opportunity, but but a, a nice callback nonetheless. I mean, that had to have been intentional. I'm guessing from like Chad Law's script forward. Well, and if they're going to be doing callbacks, wouldn't it have been cool if Dolph's Marco character gets a line where as soon as he, you know, kicks the ass of one of the henchmen, he looks at him and he says, that's a spirit soldier. Oh my you know God. What I mean? yeah. like, <laughs> like, come on. Um, oh, because he could have said it to Van Damme and everything. Mm -hmm. You got to talk to Chad again and see if we can find well, out. Well, that, 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 <laughs> that was something that Chad uh, basically said when, uh, when I spoke to him is he was like, look, um, a lot of people complained that there was, uh, that they wish there was more Dolph. He mm -hmm. goes, I wish there was more Dolph as well. And so, like I said, that kind of just, goes to my theory where I wonder if what happened, I mean, this is, this is the other part that, that I was going to get to here in a minute, but I do wonder if with, with Dolph's inclusion, if maybe that character wasn't even in the initial script and what they realized is the, is the production realized, Hey, wait a minute. I hear that Dolph Lundgren is available for, you know, the next two weeks. Let's squeeze him into this thing. If we can, let's write something in there. So, and I don't know if you kind of picked up on that or not, but I don't know. I mean, what's interesting is if you take his character out of the film and I don't want them to, as like I said, I think he's the best part about it, but you could theoretically take this character out of the film. And I think for the most part, the film is going to play pretty similarly. 
Yeah, I hadn't thought of that. That's a really interesting observation. And it could be, well, I guess judging from what the what the writer was saying, it sounded like he, that he was attached or involved early on, certainly before shooting. But I started to wonder, it's like, oh man, if they were having trouble getting Van Damme to the set, etc., did they introduce something like this just to help kind of you know, if someone's if if he's not going to come out of his trailer, then they can shoot Dolph, or <laughs> I don't know. But that might be taking it a bit too far. But I do wonder was if it were more anything more than just scheduling that prevented it from being a larger part. Because yeah, it really is a jolt of energy each time you s- see him, even if he's just sitting there reading. <laughs> yeah, I know <laughs> that says something too. A shot of him reading elevates this film. Um, I really notice like that about him because he he he's so electric but i i was happy to see that van damme was not completely sleepwalking through this and did turn on his kind of charm with the winks and stuff like that but there was a a period where even van damme wasn't in it as much and it was just the other kind of supporting characters and i was starting to i just hadn't seen a movie uh, of this particular kind of genre and i don't know i don't want to uh belittle it certainly but it just it it the the everything was feeling kind of flat to me in terms of like something just wasn't particularly working early on about the the performances and the the editing or whatever like whatever sort of alchemy has to (laughs) coalesce to make something work it wasn't quite firing on all cylinders for me and then like there was a simple scenes where like you'd see Dolph or then like when Van Dam has the scene with the where he takes the gun away from one of the other uh, characters we haven't mentioned yet. The another the female characters, he's just haven't. I was struck by the simplicity of the lines, but the just undeniable kind of movie star thing that he has was cutting through, and he was saying things slightly with just the littlest bit of like unique. I don't want to say flair, but I was just like, oh, you know, these guys they are rarefied beings you know whether it's just Dolph and van damme with their all that they've been through like physically and everything to to build up who they are but like yeah when you when you see a movie star doing their thing it's easy to take for granted until it's like put in contrast with you know us mortals <laughs> and so that was something that stuck out to me at times where just like you get the you gotta turn those guys loose and i don't know i don't know if they didn't want to as much maybe van damme <laughs> didn't want to as much but i just uh i wanted some more of that and th- there's more of it as the movie goes along but never quite enough for my taste well before we get to I'm, I'm so glad you brought that up because i think the film really does come alive at that particular point when uh when jean-claude and dolph do team up but b- before we get to there I, there's something else that i that i noticed that i just want to touch upon and i don't know if you felt though the same way or not but um so, okay, so Wheeler escapes the interrogation room and he partners up with um, someone else who's on the on the sub. Um, the actress's name is Jasmine Waltz, okay? Van Damme teams up with her. Her character's name is uh, Cassie Taylor. The character of Cassie Taylor, she has her eyes on becoming a field agent, I guess, um, like the character of Melissa, Wheeler's partner uh, at the beginning of the film. She's also old enough to be his daughter. What's fascinating about this particular about this particular character is she just has a stunning and flawless makeup job which <laughs> is just so odd considering that she's stationed on a submarine okay and, and maybe it could be because nowadays these films are are made with high definition cameras so it picks up much more but you see these scenes where it's kind of like huh she uh wants to be a field agent and not a supermodel huh okay right. you know what yeah I mean? <laughs> That, yeah, that bugged me too. That's the one I called the Megan Fox character. And it's like they had a picture of Megan Fox in these movies on the makeup trailer. And then this poor actress came in and they're like, okay, you're going to walk out of the trailer looking like that. <laughs> she's like, I don't really think that fits my character. Shut up. You know? Yeah. <laughs> Cause she's introduced as well in this like state of undress. And I don't know. I'm no prude, but it just, it's <laughs> ah, creepy. <laughs> I do appreciate that. I I did get slightly invested in her story enough to where like she had things that she wanted and she was conflicted and had her own kind of motivations. And it wasn't especially like romantic with her and the, and the Van Damme character. And I, that was nice. (laughs) And uh, yeah, I, 
I appreciate it. I guess what she was trying to do, but they did, didn't give her a lot of a lot of leeway to like be a person. Well, you know, it's so funny that you mentioned Megan Fox because did you know that she is going to be in Expendables Four, which is oh, coming out next year? I did not know that, and nor did I know until I heard it on your podcast that Van Dam uh, turned down Expendables One. That was news to me. Yeah, yeah, he he did. But you know what? I mean, I will say, I still think he's like one of the best things about Expendables too. So it's one of those things where it's like, you know what? I think, in my opinion, I think he made the right call, turning down, <laughs> turning down Expendables yeah. One. It does so. seem too with the choices that he makes. I think he's. I I remember hearing him. I don't know if I told you this, but it was such a revelation to me on the commentary, the one tr- DVD commentary I ever heard him speak on, was for Replicant. Oh, I I've, I've listened to that as well. Yes. Uh, yeah, do you remember there's the well there's the bit where eventually he just gets tired and he's like, "Look, I don't know what you want me to say here. The movie's good. I'm here with my friends." <laughs> he just like <laughs> checks out. Uh but before that at some point he would keep kind of signing off and it'd be like, "I'll talk to you soon more on Replica." Oh yeah, the <laughs> But the, the my... reason I bring it up is cuz there was one part where he just goes he he basically says he, he literally says because I'm bored with movies and I mean it. Mm-hmm. And if he was bored with movies and not able to kind of find ways to k- keep himself engaged and pushing forward in ways that, you know, people putting up money for these things or whatever would allow him 20 years ago. It's like, it's, I don't know where he's at now, but that lack of, um, of drive is all too apparent in, in, in movies like this, unfortunately, to where he only shines through here and there where he used to be. I think that's what carried all his early movies. You know, he was like, like he, the, guy, the guy was like on fire, for like from within, you know, he was like filled with this like energy that came through the screen at you. That is, it is no longer there. And, and Dolph has it more in this, in the subdued way than, than Van Damme was getting a chance to really, at least kind of play the hero and get out there and do the running and the, and the kicking and stuff. But he's still kind of, I don't know. It's just like reserved and bored. It's, Oh, you know, <laughs> it's, it's so, say it. Well, it's, it's funny. It's so, it, it's interesting. You mentioned the replicant commentary because, and, and this is so sad, David, that I actually remember this, but the one part that I remember the most from that particular commentary is there's the scene where his clone character is um, in a hotel room with a uh, with a woman of the night. We will I say, yeah. and um, and so he's talking about that scene where he's you know getting ready to kiss that gal. And I remember in that uh, in that commentary, he's like, "Oh, I moved my hands too soon. I wish I would have waited to move my hands." <laughs> like it's yeah. yeah, he's invested. You know, I mean yeah. that, that. I think it's that, and and maybe he's he still is, and it's hard to know. But I I I always I. I think you could tell when people are that invested. Like I remember seeing this b- b- off topic, but super brief, but like I remember seeing Stallone on Oprah Winfrey when Rocky five came out, Rocky five was the first Rocky I ever saw because of my age and stuff. And I just remember to this day, the only thing I can remember about that appearance was they watched a clip and they came back from watching the clip and he's still kind of looking up at it. And Oprah's like, well, you seem like you're really, like still engaged in the movies, like, you know what it is? I'm just still in the cutting room. I was like, Oh man, I could have made that cut. I could have made that cut. Yeah, and you yeah. need to have that kind of passion for stuff. Like that kind of passion is always apparent. And that's why you can have somebody like a Van Damme or Dolph Lundgren in a quote unquote bad movie and have them elevate it to the point that they did for so many years of their career. And still, you know, sometimes, but, and they do in this one, it's just not as, it's not as potent, you know, <laughs> it's, it's not quite yeah. the universal soldier uh, super serum. It's more of something else. Well, I mean, look, we, we already mentioned it. So let's get there. Okay. So Wheeler decides to level the playing field, I guess. And he finally recruits the Marco characters. This is Dolph's character to assist he and Cassie. I mean, you, we've already, we've already mentioned it, but I think he recruits him way too late in the, uh, in the film. But uh, you know, I mean, it's, I guess it's better than nothing. Um, we, we find out that Marco is German special forces and he was imprisoned on the sub because he knows way too much. And so what's, what's fascinating about their team up. Okay. And I don't know if you picked up on this or not, but we get a really cool fight scene 
where Wheeler, Marco, and Cassie are each fighting one of the commando mercenaries. Okay. And it's, it's actually, uh, I felt fairly, uh, fairly decently choreographed, especially the, the, the actress playing Cassie. I mean, she is really getting down and, you know, doing these kind of MMA grappling moves with, uh, with the commando. I mean, it's, it's a really cool scene. And there's that moment where I'm watching it and I'm thinking, like, like you said, where, where Van Damme winks at Dolph Lundgren. Okay. <laughs> so they, they team up and, uh, and, you know, Van Damme gives, gives, gives Dolph a gun and, uh, Dolph says, I know I liked you. And then Van Damme kind of winks at him. And there's this moment where it's great. You're watching it. And I'm like, this is exactly what the movie should be. It should be this kind of tango and cash. I, I'm sure oh, you've seen. Oh, hell yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah it, it should be this tango and cash dynamic between the two of them. And you get it very, here's what's interesting. You get it very, very briefly. But what's interesting is, they part ways immediately after. And that's the one thing that I did not understand is they get out of this situation. And then Dolph is like, all right, if you need anything else, you know where to find me. And he just leaves. And you're like, what? No, no, come back, please be the cash to, to the tango. Oh oh, yeah. God, that would have changed everything. It would have been so great. There is one slightly uh, humorous scene where uh, where it's right in the same uh, the same you know uh, scene of the film, but where Dolph commandeers one of the commandos' radios. Yes, this is the right. Best. This is and the he, best scene in the movie for me. Do you know why it's the best? It's because it we're we're getting this is a tango and cash dynamic here. Yeah, you know what I mean. It's fun. So, yeah, so he's he's helping uh, Jean Claude fake his own injury and death, you know. So he keeps you know punching him in the stomach, and you know Van Damme is groaning over the radio, and you're watching it, and yeah, it's like this is what we wanted to see when you hear that these two guys are going to be on the same side, and they're reuniting. This is what it should be, and sadly, there's just not enough of it, especially like I said, how Van, how Dolph just dips out of the film. He literally just, you know, was like, all right, you need me again. You know where to find me. I guess he's, what, going back to his cell to continue reading? Uh, all right. Yeah. Oh, man. Are you okay? Yeah. I mean, good call on the butt. down incoming we got to get over there wait do we have eyes on wheeler taking fire advancing i got a visual he's down he's hurt say hi asshole What about the prisoner? No longer an issue. Get him up to the mess hall. Good work, man. Should we call it in the roads? No. I don't trust that son of a bitch. I need to talk to Wheeler first. I, let me just say, I want the 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 phrase "a tango and cash" moment to be a thing that catches on and that people say far and wide. That was that was great. I, I guess we can get to the giant twist at the end. I don't know if it, it surprised you or not. Um, we find out that uh, uh, Van Dam's uh, partner at the beginning of the film, also his love interest, uh, Ballard, she was in fact the mole in the agency. She was the one working for the other side and she gets a, uh, a really fun evil line. When this is revealed, she looks at, she, she looks at Jean-Claude's character and she says, well, the sex wasn't bad. And as a viewer, you're just like, Ooh, no, <laughs> no, <laughs> that is so cringeworthy. She just seems so young. <laughs> it's, it's, it's upsetting. And the the other thing I wanted to get your op- opinion on, okay, I mean, because yeah, there's there's a final shootout that 
that occurs. Okay. Just like, and it's really no different than any of the other 20 shootouts that we saw earlier. Um, I will say the, uh, the lead who kind of takes the lead for Patrick Kilpatrick is pretty bland. I didn't find him very intimidating at all. Um, but, uh, Wheeler does get off the submarine and, uh, he is now partnered with the Cassie Taylor character. They're debriefed at the Pentagon. And we know David that this is the Pentagon because we get an exterior shot of the Pentagon, which I'm assuming is uh, stock footage. But uh, yeah, they become partners at the end. I liked that. I, I was surprised by that little. I just enjoyed the sort of light dynamic of it, and seeing Van Dam and his little like you know purple tinted glasses and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I was, I found that oh. Because this was way back early in the movie, but I want to make sure I got this right. Because this this took me out of it. Well, that's that's a. It took me a while to realize. But when he escapes from that interrogation chair, doesn't he break his thumb to do it? Yeah. So he's like the whole movie with a broken thumb. You you he didn't seem like he stubbed his toe. Like he, it affected him in no way, which was is preposterous well maybe he's like maybe he's like martin riggs right where he's able to kind of dislocate it and then pop it back in that's right well that that i like i would love to have seen a little like scene where he does the thing maybe people are laying bets and he just like slams Dolph's laying bets oh there's so many missed opportunities in this movie for tango and cash moments riggs and murtaugh moments Here's uh, what. But now he's he's got a new partner with uh with the Megan Fox. <laughs> I don't know what her name is, but uh, you know I, I'd watch that sequel. I'd love to see him paired up in a, in a buddy cop movie of any kind. And th- this actress and him, I'd I'd watch Blackwater too if that's what it was. You get Dolph Dolph still out there as we find out. Well, Dolph is still out there. Here's what I don't want to see in the sequel. Okay, so this is this is the the scene right before the uh, the credits roll. Um, so. Marco promises Jean-Claude before he, you know, leaves the film or not entirely, but, you know, before he, uh, uh, after he teams up with Van Damme and they, you know, kind of have their scuffles and then they part ways. Okay. Way too soon. All right. He, he tells Van Damme, well, I'll, I'll help you out. I'll, uh, I'll, I got your back. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll do a favor for you, if you will. And so what he does is he tracks down the, uh, the Ballard character. Okay, she's overseas in a South American country trying to uh, trying to get away. Um, he tracks her down, and he just point blank shoots her as she's in the car. And this, I don't know if you felt this way or not, but this was dark, and it really kind of it really kind of disturbed me. It was, I mean, first of all, I think it was very mean spirited, but it was also kind of out of character for his character for that to occur. And so you see that, and it's kind of like, whoa, like that's way too dark considering like tango and cash didn't do that (laughs) you know what i mean they they wouldn't kill a woman point blank who isn't you know what i mean not posing a threat i don't know uh yeah no i i i think they set his character up to be the kind of guy that would do that like maybe they said things about him like that but his his actual like behavior and demeanor and the things, the limited things we did get to see him do on screen, it didn't seem as though he was like a, a sociopath like that. And so, and especially after the lighthearted scene with, uh, or I don't know if it happened right before that or after that, but it was right around the thing with the, the new partner and stuff and the, and the Pentagon. It, yeah, it was odd to have that dark turn. It did feel like a weird tonal uh, shift. Well, one of the one of the final things I will say about this film is while it does have a few problems in terms of the narrative and the overall um, rollout of the conceit, I guess we can say. Um, if you look at the production behind it, I will say the film is not ugly. I don't think in, in any kind of way um, in, in terms of uh, in terms of the looks of it. Okay. We've seen, I mean, if you go through the podcast uh, in any of the previous episodes, a lot of these films are just filmed so cheaply with such little resources and such limited sets that you would think a film like this would just, be screaming cheap at every corner. This, I will feel it still looks fairly polished and, uh, and pretty good. Um, I guess in, in reading about it and doing a little bit of research, um, the director, the person who's credited as the director, um, is a uh, gentleman by the name of Pasha Patriki. 
in reality, I guess he was actually the cinematographer. Um, this film was actually directed by a, by a gentleman by the name of Alan Unger. Okay. This was the one who helmed the film. However, due to contractual reasons, his name is not listed as the director, but regardless, I will say it, it still looks a little bit better than any of the other cheapy productions we've seen these guys do. Yeah. And I know I, I give a little shit for looking like a disco with all the different gel colored lights on the, on the ship. But I, I, I think I would have enjoyed it. It would have affected my mood <laughs> and the overall tone. If it was like a really, you know, stark, almost black and white type or, you know, all of the, what, what what a submarine is likely to look like, you know, and people are likely to be dressed like, et cetera. Like they did go out of their way to, to make it look interesting and, and cool. <laughs> and, and, and it, and it does. And, and even just the fact that, that they did get out of the submarine and those flashbacks and stuff like that was a surprise to me. And it had a greater scope in some ways than I, than I thought it would coming in. And yeah, I mean, I think overall I just enjoyed it more than I thought I would from not knowing anything or seeing the trailer or anything, just kind of thinking I knew what it was going to be like. It, it did exceed my expectations on, on a number of levels. All right. Well, well, here we are, David again. Um, I just want to say thank you again for, uh, for agreeing to this and, and coming back, man. I, I know I broached the, uh, the topic with you back when we discussed regeneration a couple years ago, but, um, here we are. Okay. I know you had never seen this film before. So thank you for, uh, for checking it out. I'm curious. How did you check it out? I know, I know it's available on a few streaming services. Is it freebie and in, in, in YouTube or how did you watch it? I ended up ordering a, a, a Blu-ray of it because I was hoping there might be a little behind the scenes or commentary or something. And I couldn't quite figure out one way or the other. So I just decided I would, uh, I would order it when, cause it was on prime forever and now it's not. Yeah. So, so it's, I'm not yeah. sure where to where you can see it, but I I got a disc. Right on. Well, there there you go. You have another one to add to your collection. You're welcome. Yeah, yeah. I, no, I, I do. <laughs> thank you. And I don't think I I I didn't talk to you until after I watched that Universal Soldier. Was it Regeneration? What comes after that one? That what's the next one that it Day of Reckoning? Like really weird. I actually liked yeah, Day, of, Day Reckoning. of Reckoning. I thought it was pretty interesting and and cool and uh. I think when we talked, you were like, I don't know if you're going to be into that. But I, I was actually, I, I was, I thought it was really fascinating. And, uh, yeah. But anyway, so, <laughs> uh, yeah, pr- pretty, I, pretty bold direction for them to take that franchise. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. Yeah. And if he's going to be a little, hmm. um, you know, catatonic Van Dam, there was some interesting use of it there. And I hadn't seen yeah. <laughs> much, uh, Scott Atkins really prior to that, other than just like the, what he showed up uh, in Van Dam's other films. And uh, I really enjoyed that. In fact, I also really enjoyed, I think it was you that turned me on to the Scott Atkins uh, conversations on YouTube over the, the lockdown and stuff with Dolph and all kinds yeah. of other people. And I was bummed Van Dam didn't show up there. I, you know, I don't know why that is, but um, yeah, but anyway, no. so, <laughs> sorry, getting far afield as, uh, as I want to do, but I appreciate you having me. It's, I've never, I don't think I've ever spoke to a real person uh about the replicant commentary before <laughs> so that was a special <laughs> moment for me <laughs> yeah no <laughs> yeah if you wanna... people to listen but i don't think anyone ever takes me up on it do you ever want to do a watch along man just let me know and we'll uh we'll set it up um <laughs> all right so in your opinion what do you think okay as as a fan of uh as a fan of van damme as a fan of Dolph, okay what would you say about this, this film get a recommend on either of those levels as an action movie, as a, as a Van Damme film, what what do you think? Oh, I would say I'm, I'm pretty out of touch in terms of like modern action movies. So I'm not sure how it stacks up there, but I I think if you're a Van Damme, like completist, it's, it's worth checking out. I mean, it's, it's not the, uh, (laughs) such a terrible way to put it. It's not, I thought it was going to be a little bit of a chore and I ended up, you know, being pleasantly surprised at, uh, you know, how I was uh, engaged with it. It's so it was uh, fun to see Dolph like take this tiny character and, and make it interesting and fun. And I'm not one to do this, but if you fast forward through movies, that might be a way to, <laughs> to get, to just like see the fun parts. It's so I wouldn't, yeah. I don't know. I couldn't give it a wholehearted recommend, but it, uh, you know, if you're going through these guys, 
you know chronology or filmography it's it's uh it's going to be more fun than than you think yeah thank you thank you yeah the, 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 well put yeah i'm you know i'm i'm right there with you uh to, to an extent i think if you're a fan of either Lundgren or Van Damme, then I think, yeah, definitely check this out. Because I think the sheer novelty and gimmick of seeing them on screen together and this time fighting on the same side is a blast to see. While it's, uh, unfortunately, they're they're not on screen um, nearly enough, it almost comes off as a wasted opportunity as a result. But that one scene where they are together, I think that right there is... Um, is is worth the price of admission okay um i don't think it's one that you're going to go back to as often like uh like universal soldier and that that's not to mitigate the film really um but i mean if you look at the universal soldier that was a film that put these two guys together when they were in their prime okay so it's very difficult to compete with that i think as a film in general i don't think it's terrible okay the the production values are decent especially for this genre um we've seen much much worse i will say um the fight scenes are pretty fun the action sequences are all well done unfortunately with it i will say there is not one original aspect to this film okay mm-hmm. the flash drive macguffin we've seen that millions of times the submarine the setting we've seen yeah the dongle sorry uh <laughs> <laughs> the the submarine setting we've seen that dozens of times the turncoat cia operative okay these are all standard tropes of action films mainly the uh, the direct to video genre and sadly because of all this i don't think it's going to stand at the test of time as either a Dolph Lundgren vehicle or a Jean-Claude Van Damme vehicle or even really an action movie in general i think this is kind of one that um you know, I mean, here it is. We're four years removed from it already at this point, and uh, it's kind of become a little bit forgotten, hasn't it? Yeah, I mean, this is definitely not even top twenty Van Damme movies for me. Yeah, well, like I said, I, I had a. I, I mean, look, I I know it wasn't uh, top twenty. It's not top twenty, Dolph either. I did, as usual, have a wonderful time chatting with you. So thank you so very much for uh, agreeing to uh, to come back on with me. Um, before I let you go, uh, I, I'd love to give you a chance to plug anything that you're working on. Uh, if you want to give a shout out to anything, anything that you've seen, I guess, recently, what uh, what's going on? Oh, wow. The scene like really jumped out at me. But I, I think in terms of like the audience of the, the podcast, the only thing that really makes a lot of sense is just to, uh, if you're, if, if you're not too turned off by my kind of, spastic enthusiasm for the muscles of Russell. <laughs> uh, there's more of that on uh, on these uh, sort of guest appearances I've done on the Jean Pod Van Dam cast, which is um which you could get to. So if you go to my website, which is davidalman.net slash podcast and scroll down, you'll see uh the, you'll see those things kind of embedded along with the uh, my I must break this podcast appearances. And so that's I guess what I would recommend. Uh I mean on that podcast page links to my uh the 100 episodes we did of uh, the long walk short drink podcast which is not particularly time sensitive so um that might be fun too depending on uh, your interest but it's a real pleasure for me to uh get to talk to someone who's passionate and interested about these things and you do such a nice job john with this podcast it's a real honor for me to uh get to be a part of it well yeah thank you and you also have i mean i don't, I don't want to uh, let this go but you have a uh a, a, a music career Right. And so anybody yeah, can uh, of... check out and download your uh, tunes, right? Yeah, I did just, uh, so I haven't been super active, uh, recently, but I just finished, um, participating in a, an album. So my last name is Allman, spelled U L L M A N. But, uh, I've made a lot of music with my, my brother producing and playing guitar with me. So Allman Brothers <laughs> and my dad and his brother were in a band in the 60s. And just recently, uh, over the last few years, my brother produced a, a collection of songs that we put out under the name The Almond Boys uh, called Family Album. And it's just us four Almond Brothers like playing these songs together, some of them cover songs and a few originals. And uh, I've been doing a lot of storytelling around that, kind of that couple generations of Almond Brothers making music together that... I did this like five and a half hour interview with my dad and uncle and my brother. And uh, I learned so many interesting things. And I've just been kind of working with that story here the last uh, month or so. And so that's all on the website as well. But, but thank you. Yeah. Thanks for pointing that out. Have you written a song yet about, uh, about the muscles from Brussels? <laughs> no, not yet. But uh, I tend to, to, to write sort of uh, 
overly earnest and serious things, I guess, sometimes. Though I do have a, an old goofy song called Mullet Man. But there is a song that I came across about him. And I think it's called Bloodsport and Kickboxer 2, like T-O-O-O. And I want to say that the artist is ukulele, kind of a play off the word ukulele. And it is the such a fun song. Um, if if you can't find it on your own and you do end up going to davidalman.net, hit the contact thing and just say, I want that JCVD song and I'll send it to you. Because the song is essentially a celebration of the man, but also a bit of a discussion about how Bloodsport and Kickbox are kind of the same movie. <laughs> it is so fun. I wish I'd written that song. Maybe I'll play that actually at the end of the episode. Oh, actually, <laughs> so you guys are in for a treat. Yeah, if you don't mind sending that to me, because I was thinking, I don't know, have you seen uh, Chris Pratt did uh, did a song about sudden death that was on the show Parks and Recreation? <laughs> I didn't find out about that until much more recently than it happened, but yeah, that's a great gem too. Right on. Yeah. Well, yes. Uh, go ahead and uh, email that to me, and I'll uh, I'll put that at the end. So uh, <laughs> you bet. I got right. I got to download it somewhere. Well, David, thank you very, very much. Uh, it's a pleasure, as uh, as always. Uh, to everyone out there who is listening, please feel free to rate and review the show on iTunes, Stitcher, or wherever else you go to subscribe. We appreciate the reviews. And we'll see you all next time on I Must Break, this podcast. He'd have the eye of the tiger if it weren't for the powder into your guts and mash it all into a chowder he's a bad mf just watch him do the splits and ladies shield your eyes when he's killing with his hits don't let the accent fool you cause he ain't no fool nickname muscles from brussels means he's pretty van damn cool his clothes may be out of fashion but how they do show off his curves some people make fun of his acting what nerve i know it's a different movie but i have to bring it up that drunken dancing fight scene deserves the cinema's world cup is that scene supposed to crack me up because it really really does jean-claude van damme is the greatest belgian action movie star there ever was don't let the accent fool you, cause he ain't no fool. Nickname Muscles from Brussels means he's pretty Van Dam cool. His clothes may be out of fashion, but how they do show off his curves. Some people make fun of his acting. What nerve. It's amazing what he's done and only amplified his fame to make two different movies which are identically the same. Okay, Bloodsport has the kumite, and Kickboxer has broken glass on fists. I've watched these movies so many times, I hate to think of all the other great stuff I've missed. Don't let the accent fool you, cause he ain't no fool. Nickname Muscles from Brussels means he's pretty Van Damme cool. His clothes may be out of fashion, but how they do show off his curves. Some people make fun of his acting. What nerd?